135th scale, M60 A1 Rise with the M9 Dozer Blade. And now for something completely different. You know, there comes a point when even the armor tech just isn't big enough. <laughs> Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a very different walk around video. Now normally when I do these walk around videos, they're typically of you know real military vehicles as that's basically what the channel is geared to. However, after the last military vehicle show, I kind of got into the mood to change things up and do something a little different just for this one video. And what we have here is a Caterpillar D4 bulldozer. More specifically, this is a mid 1950s era produced version. Now, unlike the other military vehicles that are shown on the channel, that are, again, they are taken out of show and belong to a private collector, the unit that we have here actually belongs to us. This is our Cat D4. Now, this machine here was built by Caterpillar in the mid-1950s and was just finished, restored by my father and I. And this was something that was started probably in the mid-summer period and was literally just finished eh, probably about a week or so ago. And needless to say, this is definitely the biggest tracked vehicle that I've yet to build and or paint. And it's kind of funny in that regard. Now, a few people are probably wondering, why didn't I just make this a military or an army version? As that tends to be, again, the interest level of my, my hobbies. The reason is really twofold. First, because this unit was built in the mid-1950s, this definitely puts it out of the range of the World War II or even the Korean War time frame. Now, the Caterpillar D4 was definitely used by the U.S. military to a great extent during both of those wars, including with the version that we have here. Basically, there are two main bulldozer variants of the D4. First was this version, which utilizes a hydraulic mechanism to raise and lower the plow. And the other one is with the Letourneau overhead cable system and that's the version that has been seen quite often in many photographs. Now in addition to the vehicle being built in the post-war years, another real reason and it's probably the major reason why I did not build this as a army vehicle had to do with the plow. This bulldozer of course was acquired secondhand and the person who we purchased the machine from had went ahead and modified it past its original factory configuration. He made a lot of modifications to the blade area which actually make it a very helpful modification but in terms of making it a restorable historically accurate vehicle not so much. We'll be going over briefly what some of these modifications are in this video. Now while on the topic of the cat there are actually quite a few off-the-shelf model kits of not necessarily this vehicle here, but it's bigger brothers, the D7 and D8, in plastic from various manufacturers. These would include Mini Art as well as Mirror. Trumpeter also has a line of crawlers that are very similar to the Caterpillar, but are the Russian versions known as the Stalinets. I'll be going over those briefly as well too throughout the course of this video. The real reason why I mention this is because there, after working on this one, I gotta say that there are a lot of things about these caterpillars that a lot of builders don't really know about, and unless you are aware of this, you could possibly make a mistake during your build. There are a lot of hidden clues on this vehicle here that I'm gonna go over, which will definitely help anyone who's working on a scale model of a bulldozer and or a crawler. So stay tuned. Now I also want to point out that I am not an expert on the caterpillar series as much as some other people are. I'm very hazy on some of the details, as this vehicle here is definitely outside of my usual reference range. However, I want to point out that there is an expert on YouTube who has some really great information out there on not just these vehicles in general, but also how to restore them and how to get them up and running again. That channel is found on the link listed below, and I want to give his channel a shout out because he's partially the reason why we have this one sitting here in our driveway. Starting with the vehicle's engine, this is a four-cylinder diesel engine. Now, even though this vehicle was built in the mid-1950s, the engine and pretty much the most of the machine date back to the pre-war period of the 1930s. The engine is all original, and of course the vehicle's in full running order. Now, one thing that is very interesting as a modeling standpoint for these Caterpillars is that the way these things are started. On the original cat, the way that you start the diesel engine is with this unit over here, which is called the Pony. The Pony is a small gasoline engine, which is used to crank over the large diesel. And that's what these controls 
that we have here are for. There are a few tutorials on YouTube on how to start this thing up, but needless to say, it's a, it's a little in-depth procedure. However, for a modeling standpoint, if anyone's building the one version from Mirror, the D8 and D7 had a similar system just like this. So when it comes time for weathering that model, you want to keep in mind that the gas engine here is definitely going to start showing the, the typical type of weathering found on something that is gas as opposed to something that is diesel. Now this unit here actually had at one point an electric starter for the pony motor. You can see the spark plug or what's left of it. However, the other way to start the pony is with the flywheel. You actually wrap a rope around this guy and you yank it, which would start the engine kind of like an old lawnmower. And then from there, you would get the diesel warmed up and then you would fire it up with that method. Now the pony was cleaned up. You can see there is some compression with it. However, one nice feature that the previous owner built into this vehicle was the bypass of the pony altogether. On this particular machine, the pony is completely ancillary and is basically just an appendix. And I'll show you why in a second. Now, obviously the pony system does work, but it is an arduous task at hand to get the thing fired up. So the builder went ahead and modified this machine. You'll notice that he has this giant armor plate surrounding the bottom portion here of the engine as well as on the top portion. And that is to conceal and protect an electric starter. The electric starter, from what he told us, came from a Mack truck and he patched it into the flywheel. So now this entire machine does not use the pony, instead is electrically started by two batteries that are hooked up inside that box over there. Inside this box here contain two batteries that are hooked up in series for 24 volt. And then we have this little push button over here, is which is what is used to fire up the diesel. Now obviously this is definitely beyond what the, is found on typical cats, and it's something of an oddity. Just like this little section over here is also an oddity, as the previous guy went ahead and fabricated this large piece of steel, welded it to this section here of the cab, in order to mount in the batteries. This entire section here is not present on normal Cat D4s. The lid here was actually fabricated by myself and my father in order just to seal everything up and prevent the, the batteries from exposing the elements. While on the outside, we went ahead and fitted this shovel with the, ironically, the military vehicle route. I mean, these are two genuine military surplus tool straps and I went ahead and strapped them like I would typically on one of my tanks. You can see the fan and the radiator. Not to mention the water pump. This box here has to do with the recharging of the batteries, like I mentioned before. And here we have the oil filter. Now, of course, this is relevant for anyone who's modeling this vehicle because you need to take this cap off in order to get to the oil filter. You're probably gonna have some weathering to do on this if you're making it a use and abuse machine. Over here, we have the dipstick, is what checks obviously the oil. And the filler for the oil is this guy right over here. Now directly next to the main oil filler is this oil drain, and this is for the pony motor, which you can see the opposite side of it over here. It's a two-cylinder engine. Here's the spark plug for the reverse side. And because it's its own self-contained unit, it utilizes its own air filter. Now, just like with the other engines of the period, the air filter is an oil bat system where it uses oil to filter any solid particulates out of the air before it enters into the engine. Directly right next to it, we have the sediment filter. This again is for the, the pony. Right here is the gas tank for the pony motor. And this little sediment tube here prevents any sort of solid particulate from getting into the pony causing damage. Obviously the unit is bone dry because the gas tank is thoroughly empty on this example. Here we have the oil dipstick for the pony motor. And to refuel the oil, that's done with the other cap that we have directly on top of the hood. Here we have a pulley again for the pony as well as the carburetor and the other gizmos required to get the motor started. 
being a gas engine, it is going to have all of the same type of fittings found on any other type of gas engine of the period. From the pony takes us to the main exhaust manifold. Note the cast texturing on this guy over here. And this goes straight up through the exhaust stack with its little puffer cap that we have here on the top. Right next to it, we have a secondary puffer cap system. And this is the exhaust manifold for the pony. Now, this is where things get really interesting. I want to point this out because it's not really talked about in other videos that I've seen. This here is the air manifold for the diesel engine. Now, this pipe that we have here is actually in, it serves two functions. It serves as the air intake and it sucks air in from the environment from that air filter. But it also is the exhaust manifold for the pony. Keep in mind, one of the jobs of the pony is to heat the engine up so that the diesel can fire up. And the way this is done is with reharnessing the exhaust smoke from the pony. The exhaust smoke comes in when the pony is on, flows into this system here. The back pressure pops out of here, and then the other, when you engage the clutch to spin the main diesel, the exhaust, the hot exhaust smoke is gonna go pumped inside of the engine block, getting everything heated up until finally the diesel fires away. While on the topic of the air filter, that's the canister that we have over here. Now, this is true for not just the D4, but also on the D7s and the D8s as well. The air is pre-screened via this air filter to go into the pony as well as also into the main diesel engine. Now, this large canister that we have here is actually an oil bath reservoir. This is just a scaled up version of that small one that I showed before on the side of the pony. The way these work is that you fill this up with oil, you clamp this in place. When the engine is, is breathing for air, air gets sucked into this section, flows down into, this, into a tube that's in here, through the oil, and then into the engine. The purpose is that if there's any solid particulate, it gets trapped by the oil instead of going inside of your manifold and also inside your engine where it can cause damage. Now, if this system looks familiar, for anyone who's built a Sherman tank, you should definitely recognize this. The Sherman, as well as the M3 Lee, feature two of these found on the rear sections of the hull, and it's basically the exact same unit. Now, as a modeling standpoint, again, if you're building this as a heavily war machine, you're definitely going to want to have a lot of paint chips in this area over here, as well as also a lot of oil staining for obvious reason, as when you have a cup full of motor oil and you're trying to dangle it, trying to get these wing nuts on, the chances of spilling oil are greatly enhanced. Now, on top of the air intake, we have this dome that we have here, and there are two different versions. Apparently, earlier versions of the CAT had a more simpler system, and this one here is the more later variant. The vehicles from World War II feature the setup that we have here, and this is again true for the D7 and the D8. Now, if you notice, it has this German snorkel type visual appearance to it, and that's really where the similarities end. What this is, this is another pre-screener for the diesel engine. It kind of works similar to the FIFO system on the Tiger One. If I look underneath, you'll see a setup of intake grills. When the, when the engine is compressing and wants to suck air in, air gets sucked up into this intake, spins around this system that we have here. The solid particulate end up in this jar and then the clean air, the cleaner air I should say, runs into the oil and then finally off to the engine. Now I want to quickly point out that this unit here is technically incorrectly painted. This is actually a clear plastic jar. Now the reason why it's painted is because this one here is shot the crap and is it's got some cracks in it and needs to be replaced. So when we were rebuilding and repainting it, we just left the unit in place just to prevent paint from going on the inside. This does need to be replaced and we're trying to track down a proper jar. But on the model ones, this should be clear and in most of the plastic kits on the market, this is made out of a clear plastic piece. Moving lower, we got some gauges. Now this is where things get really interesting are the brake pedals, the brake levers, the clutch, and this is your throttle. Driving this thing is different from anything else I've driven before, including another tracked bulldozer that's over there in the back portion of the lot. Now where things get interesting are the brakes. Now like on a Sherman or any other type of a tank, when you're driving it you have a clutch 
for the transmission, and then you have a, an accelerator pedal, and then you steer by just pulling on these two levers. This is true for a Sherman or anything with a Klee track type track transmission, which is most of the tracked vehicles of the era. However, on the Caterpillar, you have a double brake system where you have a foot brake as well. Now, this is where things get a little hazy. That individual who I mentioned before on his channel, he has a much better description on how to drive these things, where when and to when and where you would utilize the lever as opposed to the pedal. Obviously though, you have a lever and a pedal for each track left or right. Now, this vehicle does not neutral steer. Obviously, that was something that was developed much later on. While on the, on the controls, we have these plastic knobs. These are actually all new. I replaced the original ones, which were all sun beaten to death and were actually all cracked and brittled up. These ones are replacements and were modded to fit onto this older unit as these were for a 1960s era machine. Now directly to my right hand side we have this system here. This is 100% not original. This, remember like I said before, the original owner went ahead and modified this unit to have the blade do some other functions. Well, that's what he did. The guy went out of his way and he really did a really nice job with the configuration here of this hydraulic pump setup where the blade can not only just go up and down, but it could go side to side and can also pivot as well. It's a very nice handy unit, however, it just, it just detracts from the historical rebuild of this unit, but again, for this machine here, it's perfectly fine. Moving back on down, now this is another aspect where it's going to help modelers in hand. This unit over here is actually how you refill the transmission fluid on this unit. It's got a spring assembly, and this little sponge on the inside, which kind of looks like a dead mouse. But it, this is, again, just a pre-filter to prevent any sort of particulate to get inside of the transmission. Obviously, something like that would be less than ideal. Now, another way that's, or something else that's really cool is the way you check the transmission fluid, and that is with this little dipstick. Now, of course, if you're modeling the D4 or the D7, obviously, you're going to want to have some oil residue in these two locations as it would definitely build up specifically if the user doesn't really care about keeping the unit clean. Now this vehicle has Zerk fittings galore. There are thousands of them on this machine. Now it's going to be kind of ironic and interesting because I did not paint them in red which is kind of funny because in all of my model showcase videos I often talk about painting the Zerk fittings. Now the reason for that is not that I forgot it or anything, or I'm a hypocrite, it's just that right now on this machine I'm still doing research on which lubricants go where. As some of the Zerk fittings are for oil and the other ones are for grease and you don't want to mix the two up. So once I figure this out, the ones for oil will be painted in red and the ones for grease we're probably going to go with a blue coloring. Again, this is just for personal cataloging reasons. But if you are building one of these model kits of the D4 or the D8 and you see the Zerk fittings, rest assured they should be painted in red. From the stick takes us to the seat. I gotta say it's probably one of the most comfortable machines I ever sat on. These Caterpillars do have these really big fat padded seats and cushions. This unit here of course is a reproduction. The original one was woefully rotted out from spending years out in the elements and the replacements were just added. Now one thing that's cool is that underneath the seat is this little secret hatch. The hatch is a of a toolbox where you would keep wrenches and other sort of material at hand. If you needed it at a pinch, you can lift the chair and get to it. The seat is just held in place via gravity. There are two lugs that the seat indexes in and it stays in place. The armrests are bolted onto the sides portions here of this seat. And this unit here locks into place again with two little tabs with corresponding notches, kind of like a painting with a picture frame. Now, one of the elements that's really cool about this machine and it's kind of the one that really caught my father's eye is the fuel tank. Now, if you notice, the fuel tank is actually built into the seat. Now, the, it might look like there's a small capacity, but it looks can be deceiving. The fuel tank comprised of this entire unit here, and as well as the bottom portion. Obviously, there's a section in the middle cut out for the use of the toolkit that I mentioned before. Now there are two types of seats on these machines. This one here is the, where the fuel tank is built in. There is an earlier type where the fuel tank would have been mounted on the side here of the fender and the seat had a slightly different design, both of which were utilized during World War II. While I'm at it, 
obviously to top off the diesel fuel, you undo this cap here. And inside we have a filter. There we go. This of course would strain out any sort of particulate found in the, the diesel fuel if dirty. And to check how much fuel you have, we have yet another dipstick. Moving our way down takes us to the actual fuel fittings. Now these units, to our surprise, were actually made of brass. We found this during the sandblasting phase, and as a way to just make the pieces look nice, we left them in their natural color, and I just coated them with a layer of varnish just to protect the brass from oxidizing. Has a nice look to it, and again, it's just something that I just wanted to point out. Moving down takes us to the transmission, the final drives, very similar to the ones on the models, but just a hell of a lot bigger and heavier. This, of course, is your drawbar. You can tow stuff with it. The unit can also pivot from side to side, and it's currently held in place by this plate over here, which we never had a reason to undo the bolt or move. Moving away to the awning, this unit here is an aftermarket component. My father fitted to this machine. Looks cool and actually is pretty helpful when sitting on this thing in the hot sun. Now, Caterpillar did have one of these awnings for their machines. It's very similar to the design of this one. The only difference is that the umbrella has the Caterpillar logos on it. From the awning, this now brings us to the fire extinguisher. Now, this unit here, we just mounted to the side of the machine because it's just good practice to have a fire extinguisher nearby, specifically when dealing with one of these older machines or just in general. The fire extinguisher is just a standard off-the-shelf commercial unit, as is the bracket. This is a aftermarket bracket that we just purchased offline and fitted to this unit. We mounted to the bracket that the guy made for the bulldozer plow, and it seemed like a nice logical location to fit it. We've fabricated this section over here, which out of an old tomato sauce can, and the only thing this does is it prevents any sort of dirt and debris kicked up by the tracks to damage the bottom portion here of the extinguisher. Following through takes us to the hydraulic system. The original Caterpillar unit has a large hydraulic pump found on the front portion here of the grill, which is why Caterpillar made this giant grasshopper style perforated plate cover to protect it. And this thing is thick. We've taken this plate off and believe me, it is a nice hefty piece of equipment. Now, originally that section over there where that T handle is would have had an original unit, which was a little bit smaller and simpler. And that would have connected to this yoke that we have right over here. The yoke would have been positioned this way and would go in and out, and that would raise or lower the, bu the bulldozer blade. Now, when the guy modified it, he redesigned the system to the way that you see it here. Now, these two tubes are your entry and exit, and these are original to the cat. What is added though are the rest of these hydraulic lines that we have here which are for the various other functions and pitches that this blade can now do. In fact the original hydraulic pump still has its original handle found in this section and this unit plus these two tubes here are original to the Caterpillar. Like I said before there are two versions this is the hydraulic version and the other one was the overhead crane. Now the hydraulic ones from what I've seen were more common in Europe, however, that's not to exclude the overhead ones as well. Like I said, they were both widely utilized. However, the problem with the hydraulic ones from what I've seen is that in the Pacific theater, the hydraulic lines would rot out due to the jungle environment. So the cable versions were a little bit more robust compared to their hydraulic counterparts in the Pacific theater. From the hydraulics now takes it to the armored plate that's on the bottom of the machine. The plate that we have here is very thick and very very heavy. Trying to take, we tried to take it off during the restoration, and we were able to partially do it until we had to stop because we didn't have a hoist strong enough to lug this guy up. So we just worked around it. This thing was filled with dirt and cement and all sorts of nastiness, and there was probably about 200 pounds of crap in here that we had to remove just to get it cleaned out. But one thing's for certain: this plate is strong as you can imagine. On the rollers, there's another armored skirt that was added. Now this was made by the previous owner. He fabricated this out of plates of steel, welded it together, and just bolted to the bottom of the unit. There were several of these skirts that were developed over the years, but the one that you see here are one-offs made by the previous owner. 
Well, from there, that now brings us to the paint and the markings. The paint we used was the original Caterpillar Yellow. Now, with the vehicle at this age period, it could have also went with Highway Yellow, which is a slightly different shade. This one's more of an orange color, while the Highway Yellow is just a brighter type yellow like the awning that we have here. The markings are the older style pattern from the 1930s and were replaced in the mid-1950s with a different type of typeface. For this machine here, we went with the older typeface as well as with the newer Caterpillar Yellow. Because of the mid-1950s that this machine is, from what I've seen, this could be a transitional unit and you can have a mix of the two. The markings are decals from the Akmak form, which is the Antique Caterpillar Collectors Club. And they came as a set, and I went ahead and installed them to this unit, making this literally the biggest vehicle, or biggest model, I should say, that I've ever had to put Martin decals on. And with that, that wraps up this detail walk-around video for this restored 1950s-era Caterpillar D47U bulldozer. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to this channel, where it's a great way to keep up to date on new posted content. Well, not so much this guy over here. This is more or less a one-off. But for the usual real military vehicle walk-around videos or the more prevalent small and large-scale model showcase videos that commonly get posted to this channel. Another way to keep in the loop of new posted content is by liking us on Facebook. There, I have more photographs of this particular vehicle here as well as the other smaller and larger scale builds that have been posted on the channel in the past. Furthermore, don't forget to swing by EastCoastArmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detail components. Now back to your regularly scheduled programming. Till next time.